Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. It's Thursday, June 8th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. For the 23rd year in a row, Missouri police are pulling over, ticketing, and arresting black motorists at a disproportionately high rate. But what I would want to know is why things haven't changed over time, and I don't think that we have a good answer to that. Coming up, St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All will have a conversation with a criminology and criminal justice professor about the report. Governor Mike Parson has signed two bills restricting gender-affirming health care access and sports participation for transgender Missourians. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Kellogg reports. Before the Missouri legislature passed two Senate bills restricting sports participation and gender-affirming care access for transgender Missourians, Parson threatened to call a special session over the same issue if those bills did not pass. One of the bills stops transgender minors under 18 from accessing some forms of gender-affirming care like puberty blockers. The other bars transgender athletes from participating on school sports teams that align with their gender identity. However, both bills either partly or entirely expire after four years. That addition was part of compromise language added to stop a Senate Democratic filibuster. Senator Greg Ray a Kansas City Democrat who is the only openly gay member of the Senate said, quote, when these bills expire in four years, I plan on being there to make sure they never come back. In Jefferson City, I'm Sarah Kellogg, St. Louis Public Radio. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has signed a budget he calls balanced and compassionate. Alex Degman reports. Pritzker capped off a week-long statewide budget tour at Chicago's Christopher House to sign the $50.4 billion spending plan that takes effect July 1st. It sends more money to early childhood and K-12 education, plus MAP grants, which will make it easier for more students to attend college. Pritzker says this budget reflects the state's priorities. We've eliminated our overdue bills. We've paid down $10.5 billion in debt, including pension debt. Our once empty rainy day fund is now rising to $2 billion. The budget passed with no Republican support. They say it's full of gimmicks and doesn't address, for example, the true cost of a program providing health care to undocumented immigrants. I'm Alex Degman. Metro Transit is making another round of route changes to help reduce unplanned bus cancellations because of driver shortages. The adjustments take effect Monday. They include a reduction in services or temporary suspensions on 30 routes during low ridership times like weekday evenings and weekends. Metro says that will allow resources to be used on higher demand bus lines. Other revisions are designed to make sure more buses run on time. The transit agency has made several changes in the last couple of years to address driver and mechanic shortages. Grants for businesses and nonprofits in North St. Louis were among the initial commitments from the half billion dollars of pandemic relief funding for the city. But the $37 million promised has been slow to flow to those entities. A new bill before the Board of Aldermen would amend older legislation, making it easier to apply for the grants. Shamim Clark Hubbard sponsored the legislation. There are people that have applications in. There are businesses that have been waiting and counting on the opportunity to be able to get this money to build or revitalize their business that they have hung on to, not to mention that was during a pandemic. Clark Hubbard says the bill eliminates key barriers, including the requirement that a specific project have upfront financing and a letter of support from the alderman whose ward it's located in. A St. Louis Board of Aldermen committee has endorsed the city's first water rate hike in more than a decade. Utilities committee members have voted to send the measure to the full chamber It boosts rates by about 20 percent, or $5 a month, starting July 1st. A second increase of 20 percent would kick in on January 1st. The average customer will end up paying $120 more for water. Future increases would be based on inflation starting in 2026. The city's water department says the hike is needed to pay for basic operating expenses. O'Fallon Illinois High School has a new award. The program recently received the Suttler Flag of Honor. St. Louis Public Radio's Will Bauer has more. The award distinguishes outstanding musical excellence and was given to just two band programs across the country for 2022. Since its creation in the 80s, only 87 high school band programs have gotten the award. Assistant Band Director Philip Carter says it's a great honor for the school's concert, jazz, and marching bands. It's, it's great. 
because it's it's confirmation that what we're doing on that day to day is a really big deal. The John Philip Sousa Foundation awards the Sudler flag. That foundation honors the famous American composer known for his marches. At the celebration concert, the band's wind ensemble performed the Black Horse Troop March. I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. The latest report on traffic stops in Missouri shows black motorists were disproportionately stopped by police. After they were pulled over, they were more likely to get a ticket or arrested than white drivers. It's the 23rd consecutive year the data have shown this to be the case. St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All spoke with Lee Slocum, a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, about the report. What do you make of this trend that for the 23rd year in a row, black motorists are disproportionately getting stopped in Missouri? And I think that's a it's a difficult, difficult question to ask. But what I would want to know is why things haven't changed over time. And I don't think that we have a good answer to that. Uh, and I think that um, we're starting to get the data that will help us understand what's going on there. But it certainly is a disturbing pattern. What don't we know that we need to know? I think one of the things we need to know is how these processes are operating in different agencies and in different places. In some places, the disproportionate stop may be due to um, how things are measured. Other places, it may be due to bias. And in other places, it may be due to things like differential enforcement patterns and policies and practices. Um, So I think to understand what is going on and why we haven't solved this issue, I think uh, requires more data and digging into specific um, individual level data for each agency um, and understanding what is going on there. Are you getting at that the overall numbers don't tell us all that much and it's really more what is Department A doing and what is Department B doing? It's not that the overall numbers don't tell us anything, but I think they make it hard to understand what the solution is. Um, And that solution might look different in different agencies. Do you have any ideas of what you think needs to change? Well, what I think needs to change is I think, first of all, each agency needs to take a look at their own data, understand what is happening in there. Um, You know, for example, do they see individual officers who are stopping uh, black individuals at a higher rate than other officers? Um, Or is this how um, they're deploying their officers? Um, And then I think the next thing they need to consider is whether these practices are having the goal they want, which I assume is to keep communities safer. Especially over the last five to 10 years, we've heard a growing cry that police are racist or at least have a large racist element within them, doesn't data like this suggest that that may be the case? It certainly fits that pattern, yes. Um, But again, I think, I mean, I guess I want to stop the narrative of things aren't changing, right? So um, places like St. Louis County, St. Louis City, they are making changes, um, to um, to address a lot of these issues. So there are good things going on, um, things like jail reform, um, police reform, even some legislative reform is going on. So I think um, there are good things that are happening. Do we have any hope for substantial change? Yes, there is hope. There are people working on reform. There are people dedicated to reform. A lot of that is going on in the St. Louis region. Um, And, you know, there's been a level of distrust that has kind of built up over many years. It's going to take a long time to change that. Um, But there are specific policies and practices that are being implemented that can can help to alleviate some of the issues in in the region um, and at the state level. I'm so criminology and criminal justice professor Lee Slocum. Thank you very much. Okay. That was UMSL Professor Lee Slocum speaking with St. Louis Public Radio's Jonathan All. 
Our Brian Moline edited that report. Ashley Lisenby is the news director of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com.